Recruiting and advertisement are essential elements of any successful organization or business. The United States Marine Corps has some of the most iconic recruiting slogans. There is simply no denying the power behind the Marine Corps recruiting messages. As we look back at some of the most iconic slogans that have driven men and women to list in the United States Marines for the last 240 years, two slogans stand out. First, the Marines are looking for a few good men. Who doesn't want to be among a select few good men? This phrase or some variation of it has appeared on several recruiting posters throughout the history of the Marines. But this slogan wasn't created in an advertising boardroom. The roots of a few good men go back to 1799 when a Marine captain named William Jones came up with the idea. The second is the few the proud, the Marines. Eventually, the Marine Corps decided to shorten this famous phrase and added the proud to the mix. It seems to have been quite effective since the few, the proud, the Marines is still used heavily in modern recruiting efforts. This recruiting slogan was so popular that the internet voted to place it on the walk of fame for advertising slogans on Madison Avenue in New York City in 2007. This slogan reflects the unique character of the Marine Corps and underscores the high caliber of those who join and serve our country. However, the United States Marine Corps was not the first one to use that phrase, looking for a few good men to serve. God was the first, and he's still looking for a few good men as well as women, to teenagers, and children to serve him. However, unlike the Marines who are concerned about our physical security, Jesus is more concerned about our eternal security. Amen? In other words, Jesus is concerned about our salvation. So much so that he, he went to Calvary's cross for our sins. To continue his redemptive work, he handpicked faithful servants to join him to complete his kingdom agenda on this earth, which is to reach the lost and disciple to save. However, the scriptures tell us the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Amen. That is the message we want to tag this, this sermon with today. The title, the, uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. From Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20, a little bit of background. In order to understand Luke chapter 10, we must start with Luke chapter 9. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 1 says, and he called the 12 together. This is his 12 original disciples. He gave them power and authority over the demons uh, to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that city. And as for those who do not receive you as you go out from the city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Departing, they began going throughout the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Because Jesus had so much work to do, he called more disciples to help him in his kingdom work uh, on this earth. These disciples are in addition to the original 12 disciples. Amen? So here's the question I have for you today concerning this passage. Although many are called and only a few are chosen, what are the three great benefits that God guarantees all true disciples. Another way you could say that even though the harvest is plentiful and the labors are few, what are the benefits of those disciples who accept God's calling on their lives? What are three things I want to give you from this text today? The privilege of being chosen by God, number one. Number two, the responsibility of being used by God, number two. And number three, the joy of being eternally blessed by God. Amen? Now let's unpack these three principles through this text. So again, what are the three principles to teach us that with privileges come responsibility? Again, although many are called and a few are chosen, what are the three benefits that God guarantees all true believers? Number one, again, the privilege of being chosen by God. Chapter 10, verse 1 said, Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others, and many translations say 72, with 70, 72 others. And he sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he was going to come. 
Amen. In other words, these 72, just like the original 12, he's sending them ahead of him to places he had already was going to go. And what they're going to do is lay the groundwork and prepare people's heart for his coming. Amen. So it says, after these things refers to the things that transpired in chapter 9. Well, let me give you a few of those things that transpired in chapter 9. The morning Jesus sent out the 12 apostles. The second thing it tells us, Jesus fed the 5,000. The third thing, Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ. Number four, Jesus foretold his death. Number five, uh, take to, uh, he told his disciples to pick up their cross and to follow him. Number six, the transfiguration. Number seven, Jesus healed a boy with an unclean spirit. Number eight, Jesus again foretold his death. Number nine, the disciples argued about which of them is the greatest. And number 10, Jesus ended chapter nine by teaching the disciples about the cost of following him wholeheartedly. And then the Lord appointed 72 uh, others also. Jesus knew that the time was short before his crucifixion and there were still many villages ha that had not yet heard his message. Jesus turned to this larger group of his disciples to be his messengers, to, be pre to prepare these places ahead of him where he was about to go. Amen. Do you realize that Jesus is still using this same method today? He's preparing uh, the rest of the world through his disciples today, me and you, to prepare them for his coming. Amen. You and I are supposed to be his disciples delivering that message today. Amen. The way that you live will tell people what you believe about God. Amen. It's not just what the words that come out of your mouth. It's the lifestyle you live. You can say all you want that I'm a Christian. Unless your life screams Christian, then either you're not a Christian or you're not a good example. Amen. And so when people know you, they would say that uh, what they should remember about you, uh, not what kind of house you live in or how fancy it is, not kind of car you drive or how fancy that may be, not the clothes you wear and how fancy those may be. But what people should know from you more than anything else is where you stand with God. Amen. They should know that you love him and that you live your life for him every day. More than anything else, that's the word that your grandchildren should see, your children should see, your coworkers should see, your classmates should see, your family's members should see, no matter where you are. There's nothing about you should ever say that I'm ashamed of the gospel. Amen? When we are not what we're supposed to be, you could be sending the wrong message to God that I'm ashamed of the gospel. When you don't come to Bible study, you might be telling God the wrong message inadvertently. Maybe that's not what you're trying to do, but that's what you're doing nonetheless. Because God wants to disciple us. He wants to teach us. He wants to grow us so that he can use us. Amen? And discipleship, once again, is the developmental process where God takes us from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity so we can repeat the process with somebody else. Amen? In other words, God didn't just save you for you. God saved you for a bigger picture than you. You always hear people say that my Christianity is my business, nobody else's. Then they don't have biblical Christianity. Because God saved you to be part of the body of Christ. Amen? That means you have brothers and sisters in Christ that God has called you and placed you with so that you don't have to walk this journey by yourself. Amen? When you choose to walk your journey by yourself, then Satan is having a party in your honor. Amen. Because he loves to catch us where we're not supposed to be, doing things we're not supposed to be doing. And he loves to catch us when we're not spiritually growing. Amen. There are things that you and I must do in order for us to grow spiritually on a regular basis. And part of that growth is studying the word of God, individually as well as collectively. Part of that is also worshiping God individually as well as collectively. Amen. But it's important that we understand that what God does is he teaches us and grows us because he does more when we come together than oftentimes he does with us alone. Amen. And so if you understand uh, this calling of, of Jesus understood that, that there's just too much work to do. And from the time he started his earthly ministry, he was 30 years old. When he went to Calvary, he was 33 
about three, 33 and a half. Okay? So he had three and a half years to prepare those he would leave behind when he ascended back to heaven to continue his work of turning this world upside down. Amen? So he invested time with these disciples. Amen? And this included more disciples than just these additional 72. Amen? But it's something we're going to learn about these 72 today. Some of us who may not be very familiar with this passage. Amen? Verse 2 says, and he was saying to them, Jesus was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. Amen. The harvest represents the world. Amen. The fact that it's plentiful because God didn't put a lot of people on this planet. Amen. And the fact that the labors are few, the labors are genuine Christians. That's who the labors are. The labors are faithful Christians. So he says the labors are few. That means there's not enough Christians who are willing to go out and do the work. Amen. What about you? What kind of work did you do for the kingdom? Amen. Does your work for the kingdom only include you showing up for church or tuning in for church? And after that, you close your Bible and you do whatever you want to do, whatever is on your agenda for you the rest of the week. Then I would submit to you that you're not doing it right. Amen. Because each and every day that God wakes me and you up, we should say to God in our prayer time, God, use me for the purpose you woke me up. Be careful praying that, though. Because once you pray that, then some circumstances and situations is going to happen in your life during that day. And sometimes it's going to be something you weren't ready for or wanting in the first place. But they come with the territory of being a disciple, a true disciple of Christ. And God will interrupt your plans in order he insert his. Amen. And a true disciple allows God to interrupt their plans so he can insert his plan. Amen. You might not intend on talking to that person that day, going that place first, that, that place that day, or even staying there that long. But you have to have enough discernment to know when God has put somebody in your path and God said, that's an assignment for you, and I want you to minister to them. Amen. You got to be very careful because a lot of times we miss a whole lot of opportunity. And we say, boy, I wonder why God don't use me. Well, he's been trying. But you have not been enough discerning enough to change your schedule for his schedule. Amen. He's been trying to reach people through you, but you have not been that available vessel. That's why Jesus says in this text, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. And I think Reverend Ingram would say it this way. There's never a shortage, shortage of customers. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> There's never a shortage of customers. Amen. Amen. As I've said to you, that if so many people live in this community, if just the people in this community decided to go to church today, there wouldn't be enough buildings to hold them. Amen. You have to convert buildings, have use other types of buildings, or have outside services. If people actually chose to get up and go and go to public worship, Amen. I'm reminded of, of, of some of these people who live in these villages in Africa, and some of these people that are very poor. It, uh, compare, compared to American standards. And you have these people, they don't have what you and I have. They don't have the cars we have. They don't have the clothes we have. They don't have access to the food we have. And so they, didn't, they wouldn't care if the church house is an hour away on foot. And they wouldn't care that it's raining. And they wouldn't care if the service lasts hours and hours. They go and worship God, knowing they got to walk all back back home. They would do it anyway with glee and with joy. But how is it that in America we come to church and act like the frozen chosen? And when God has done so much for us continually, blessing us the way He does, and we can't, God can't get an amen out of us. Amen. Can't get us to praise. Can't get us to sing. Well, what's going on in your life? Has not God not done enough in your life this past week 
that when you come into the house of God, that you can't open your mouth and shout about it? There's no thank you, Jesus, coming out of you. That there's not enough thanks that God blesses us the way he blesses us. Amen. If somebody would have told you years ago, maybe when you're a lot younger, that you'd be where you are today, would you believe them? Would you, would, would they, would you believe them when they say, hey, at this point in your life, you're really going to be devoted to God? Maybe not now, but there's going to be a day that all you're going to want in your life is Jesus. How did you get there? How did you get to a point in your life when nothing else matters, with all the craziness going on in the world, that nothing else matters to me but Jesus? Amen. And I know we, they always run around doing these polls and checking on people, and people always tell me how angry they are, how mad they are. If you're a believer and God has supplied all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, it doesn't matter what's going on next door. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And as for me and my house, it doesn't matter what things cost, God still supplies. That verse doesn't say God supplies based on what the economy is doing in the United States in 2022. That the verse doesn't say that, does it? So why am I angry? Why am I so mad? Because sinful people do sinful stuff and I'm mad. And I have no peace in my own home and all my own life because I'm mad at what somebody else is doing or saying. Then you're not walking with Jesus that moment. Amen. Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. That's what Nehemiah proclaimed in Nehemiah 18. Nehemiah's journey wasn't easy, but he understood where joy came from and where strength came from. Amen. Do not let what's going on outside of you dictate what's going on inside of you. Amen. Don't jump in that crowd that they mad and politics is their religion and everything else and you can't even enjoy this walk with God. Jesus didn't say it wasn't going to be difficult. He never said it was going to be easy. In fact, he did say it was going to be difficult. In this life, you'll have tribulation or trouble, but be of good cheer. I'll overcome the world. John 16, 33. Amen. I'm just amazed at how many Christians get, jump in the bandwagon with all these folks that are angry. So angry. They show up dressed in camouflage and guns to sit at a polling booth. Where you drop off your, your, your what's wrong with this country? What's wrong with people? You ain't got nothing else to do? <laughs> go serve. Go do something. Go help the homeless. Go, go do something. That makes absolutely no sense to me. But this is what we become as a country. But then we claim that we are a nation under God. No, let me help you a lot today. Let me tell you what we are. We are a nation in trouble with God. Not a nation under God. Amen. Because the United States is just as sinful as any other nation around the world. Only difference is we just got more stuff to be sinful with. Amen. We just got more resources to waste and do all manner of things that God didn't intend for us to use those resources for. Amen. There should not be one person in the United States that misses a meal with all the food we have and the food we throw away. Amen. There should be one empty seat in, in every church. There's a church owned by God. Not today. Because the Bible said the church is a hospital for the sick. And all of us got some sickness, so every church ought to be full. Amen. Every person, this is what Jesus is trying to get disciples of that day to understand, which the principles still apply to us today. Amen. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers of few describes a large number of people ready to receive Jesus. Ready to follow his, in his kingdom message and uh, relatively few people available share the message of the kingdom. Say it ain't so. That's because we fail in our responsibility to do what it is God called us to do. You got too many closet Christians today. Too many closet Christians. 
You wouldn't even know they were Christian unless they told you. You wouldn't know what they, they were Christian unless they wore a t-shirt, I guess. You wouldn't know they were Christian unless they held, held up a sign. Because there's nothing about their life screams Christian. You wouldn't even know. If Jesus is really in you, it should be evidence to people around you. Amen. They should know where you stand. They should know, even if you didn't tell them you're a Christian, but everything about you is living word. Amen. This large number of people ready to receive Jesus. There's, there's a song, that, uh, more contemporary Christian song. It says, they're trying to get the Jesus, but they keep tripping over me. They're trying to get to Jesus, but they can't because I'm in the way. I'm blocking the door. I'm, no, I'm just like the Pharisees and Sadducees in Scripture. They're not getting in the glory. This is what Jesus told them. But you hinder other people from getting in. And that's what the church has become today. And that's why people don't attend. That's why people have given up. Because the church is not preaching Bible. The church is preaching politics, whatever the left or the right wants to be talk about. Has infiltrated the pulpit, and that's what people are talking about. And people say, I don't want no part of that. This is why people don't see the need to be involved in what they call organized religion. If you don't believe it, just talk to your neighbor. I don't believe in organized religion. I just worship God at home. You hear it all the time. Amen? Again, the workers are kingdom people willing to do work God has called them to do. He said the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. The few means that God does not have enough faithful servants to do his work. Now, we realize that much of the world is unsaved. Seven billion, almost eight billion people on this planet, billions upon billions of people are not children of God. They're not believers. Amen. There are actually less Christians on this earth than they are, are actually more non-believers on this earth than they are Christians. That means that, that that's that harvest field that Jesus is talking about. Your neighbors, your family members, that's the harvest field. Amen? Make sure in your Christian journey that you never lose sight of the cross. Whenever a believer loses sight of the cross, the way they live will reveal it. You hear stories of people running into buildings and saving people, do you not? You hear people showing up at the scene of a car crash and pulling people out of a burning car and saving them before the car explodes. You hear people finding out uh, someone needs a kidney and not even related to that person. And they go giving a kidney so that person can survive. You know what normally happens in those relationships? Those people are bonded together the rest of their life. Why? Because the person who has been saved Loves the person who saved them. And because they love the person that saved them, they say, I'm not related to you, but the rest of your life, you family to me. The rest of your, the rest of your life, you're going to have to put up with me. The rest of your life, I'm in your life. Because it comes because of the fact that you saved me. Now, Jesus saved us from a whole lot more than that. And why we don't have that type of commitment to him when he saved us. When he gave his life as a ransom for many. But again, when I lose sight of Calvary, guess what? Church doesn't matter to me. Attendance. When I lose sight of Calvary, Bible study doesn't matter to me. When I lose sight of Calvary, my prayer life is empty. When I lose sight of Calvary. But if I keep my focus on Calvary, I will get up and do those things that I don't really feel like doing, but I do them because of what he did for me. 
on a normal day during the week, I get up five, a little bit before five, to go to the gym. And there are many days I don't feel like getting up. Because five o'clock comes around real fast. So I just laid down, it's time to get up. And you know the reason why I do that? You know the reason why I'm committed to that? Because my physical health depends on it. I got issues you can't tell. Maybe some of y'all can't tell. He got issues, yeah. I pray for our pastor, he got issues. But what I'm saying is, is that I don't need them to get worse. So the best thing for me to do is try to keep my weight down and, and, and stay healthy by exercising on a regular basis. I don't feel like it. It ain't fun as it used to be. It hurts. But you know why I do it? Because the significance and importance of the benefit. All right. Let me make it plain. As I often tell you, I don't come to church because I'm supposed to. I don't come to church because I need to. I don't come to church because I have to, even though those are true. But I'm so far past that. I come because I get to. Amen. I come because the king of king and lord of lord gives me a personal invitation. And I'm just not in the business at my age, and as long as I've been one with God, to turn down the invitation. How about you? How often do you turn down God's invitation to help you grow closer to him? This is what he's teaching these disciples of his in the text. He's sending them out as he wants to send us out into a world that's not kind to believers. But he's sending us out to reflect his glory in dark places. You ever understand, you ever notice that the brighter your light shines, the darker places God sticks you? Because God wants glory from your story. Amen. We're God's hand and eyes and ears and feet on this earth. That's what the body of Christ is. We're his vessels for carrying the gospel message to a dying world. That's our responsibility. But we keep trying to pawn that responsibility off to the United States government. And that's why people have married their religion to, that's what's called nationalism. You hear the term used now called Christian nationalism. That's an oxymoron. Let me help you out. That's an oxymoron. You're not a Christian because of what country God birthed you into. That being, being, a, being an American citizen doesn't make you a Christian, even though no more than parking yourself in my garage make you a Cadillac. But people assume when they come to America because we've thrown off this false projection, hey, this is a bunch of Christians in America. Well, let me help you out. There's far more non-believers in America than there are Christians. Amen. And some of y'all didn't know that until you got here. Because the same craziness go on in your countries where you come from with upheaval and everything else. And some of y'all are here today all because of the craziness going on in your country. So you sought asylum in the United States. And now you see the same things happening with the government in, in the United States that was happening in your government. When lies become truth and truth becomes lies. Didn't the Bible warn us about that? It does. Now, it'd be one thing if that's what the world was doing. But the church is in on it. There are certain churches and people that are in on the scheme. There's no way that what's going on with the federal government should dictate what we do as far as worshiping God. You reach more people when you use honey than using vinegar. Do you not? This is what Jesus is trying to tell us when he sent out these, these disciples. Imagine these 72 people, two, he sent them out two by two. They walked into the town and told everybody in here, hey, y'all, y'all going to hell. Y'all going to hell. Y'all going to hell. Is that what they did? Why they didn't do that? Because even though that may have been true, that wasn't their role. 
So even though it may be true today, but that's not our role, but that's what the church does. It turns more people off than they turn people on. Because we're so get busy telling people what they can't do, we don't even tell them what they can do. Amen. Yes, things you shouldn't do as a Christian, but there are far more things that's a blessing that you can do in the believer. In other words, when, when you and I got saved, God didn't want us to stop partying. He wanted us to change dance partners. Some of y'all get that on the way home. Instead of getting down with Satan, he wants you to get down with him. But instead of doing the worldly dance, he wants you to do the Holy Ghost dance. Amen. The harvest is plentiful. The labors are few. Send out workers into the vineyard, he tells us. This is a powerful message from a text that oftentimes we overlook. Why do we overlook it? Even though we may know what it says, we may have read it before, but we don't always put ourselves in the text. We don't always put ourselves in the position of saying, how does this affect me? And you need to do that. Because you need to follow the text. You need to track the story. Amen. Because just like he did in chapter 9, he had already chosen the original 12, and he knew that he needed more disciples in order to finish his work. By the time that Jesus got to Calvary and to the ascension, there were 500 people that he revealed himself to. After he, after he rose from the dead, 500 people. Well, what happened to the rest of the people? Let me help you all out. The longer that Jesus preached, the smaller the crowds got. Wow. Shouldn't it have been the opposite? Shouldn't it have been the opposite? The longer he preached, the bigger the crowds he got? Because for some of them, they were only following him because they needed something fixed. Whether it's their health, a situation, finance, whatever it may be. Issues with their government. That's, what, that's the only reason why they, they, they... But by the time they figured out that he was talking about something different, that's why when he, when he was there, before he ascended, that's why it was only 500 present. So you would think today that the stronger the message, the more correct the biblical message, that churches would be filled. But you know why people don't? Because why do I want to sit there and hear what I'm not doing all the time. Because I've made up my mind, I'm not following him. I don't care much how much pastors preach about it. I've made up my mind. I'm just not going to be committed. And I don't like being reminded that I'm not committed. But if you remind me of something I'm already doing, then why would I get offended? I wouldn't. And even if I'm not doing it, I need to be doing it, I should say thank you so I can start doing it because it's God reminding me. You can't shoot the messenger when the message is scripture, meaning the message is from God. Amen? So again, these three principles are the benefit that, that, that God guarantees all true disciples, the privilege of being chosen by God. Verses 1 and 2. The second purpose, the principle is the responsibility of being used by God. God chose us because he chose us to use us. Amen? He didn't just choose us just to be chosen. He chose us to use us. Again, the responsibility of being used by God. Look at verses 10 through 16. Look at the nine imperatives in this text. There are nine imperatives. An imperative is a command. For a short pericope of scripture to have so many commands in it, that means there's things in it God wants us to pay attention to. Amen. First, he says, go. That's the first imperative. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Lamb in the midst of wolves means that they would face much hostility from people that oppose God's kingdom agenda being fulfilled in their lives or the lives of others around them. The second imperative, he says, carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, or and greet no one on the way. Disciples were to be completely focused on their calling and not be deterred in any way from it. This is what happens to us. 
Many Christians start out well, but guess what? They get deterred along the way. Amen. You've got to be careful of allowing people to deter you from where you're supposed to be and what you are supposed to be doing. Amen. This is why he uses such strong language in this text about watching out and not being deterred. He said, whatever house, verse 5, whatever house you enter, for, first say, all right, another imperative, third imperative, peace be to this house. If a man of peace, in other words, the one who has found divine peace through salvation is there, your peace will remain on them. In other words, if they're there and you pronounce peace and blessing upon them, if they're actually kingdom citizens, the blessing remains, the peace remains. Are oh, you getting what I'm telling you? He said, your peace will rest on them, but if not, it will return to you. The people they encountered would, who accepted the kingdom's message would support them by demonstrating hospitality. The fourth imperative, he says in verse 7, stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the labor is worthy of his, of his wages. The fifth imperative is do not keep moving from house to house. The reason why he tells him that because in Near Eastern culture, when you went to someone's house and you stayed and you got up and left, went to the next door neighbor's house, you defend the people's house you were already in. Amen. As though their house wasn't good enough. Oh, y'all getting it now. Right. In other words, accept the hospitality from those who are welcoming you. In other words, show hospitality by remaining with them, being a blessing to them, as long as you're in that place. Now, when you got up and went to the next town, you'd have to go to another house. All right? This is why he told them don't carry any uh, money bags with them and carry extra clothes or shoes. The reason why is he's trying to tell them something. He's trying to tell these disciples, you're going to have to depend on me for everything you need when you go on this journey. Amen. The problem with us is we don't get anything done because we think we have to do it within our own means. Amen. And when God is moving your life, as I often say, when you do it your way, you got to pick up the tab. But when you do it God's way, he's got to pick up the tab. Amen. He says, A minister is worthy of his wages. Now watch this. Jesus told the disciples to accept the hospitality of grace because their work of ministry entitled them to it. The Apostle Paul alludes to this principle in 1 Corinthians 9, 14 and quotes it in 1 Timothy 5, 18. What he means is this. Pastors and ministers of the gospel that work for the church deserve to be supported. And it's our responsibility to make sure we have what they need. There are several ways to encourage those who serve God in his church. Number one, see to it that they are adequate, adequate salary. Number two, see that they are supported in motion. This includes planning a time to express appreciation for their work and service to the Lord on your behalf. Number three, lift their spirits with special surprises from time to time. Our pastors and ministers deserve to know that they are appreciated because the work uh, uh, ministry uh, full time is not easy. Many pastors and ministers give up in the gospel, serving the gospel, because the people don't appreciate it. At least they don't show they do, at least often enough. Let's keep keeping it real. Lift their spirits with special uh, surprises again, kind words and gestures. Uh, in other words, nothing blesses the pastor more than members being fat Christians, faithful, available, teachable, tithing team players. On the other hand, nothing discourages a pastor more than when Christians are not fat Christians. Amen? Verse 8 says, whatever city you enter and, uh, and they receive you, the sixth imperative is eat what is set before you. Number, uh, the seventh imperative is verse 9, and heal those who are sick and say, eighth imperative to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, ninth imperative, even the dust of your city, which clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. Here's what you got to understand. 
When people keep rejecting you over and over again because you want, to see, want their lives to be full of grace and, and God's presence, and you're trying to lead them to faith in Christ and get them to walk with Christ, well, here's the thing. It's not you that they rejected. It's God that they rejected. And they're offended because you bring that message. They're offended because you live that message. They're offended because you are that message. Amen? But you can never get discouraged because doing kingdom work is not easy. Amen? Verse 12, he said, I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. That says a lot. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember? Genesis 19, 24, he destroyed, uh, God destroyed Sodom along with, that's a, that was judgment. These cities are mentioned in the New Testament to illustrate divine judgment. He said, woe, Chorazin, woe to you, but, but, uh, Bethsaida, for if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago. Singing in Sychoc and Ashes. In other words, he brings up these Gentile cities, these non-Jewish cities, because he said, if I had done what I did with them that I did with you, they would have repented long ago. When he says, woe to you, which is a strong warning. Chorazin, a town near Capernaum. Capernaum, the home base for Jesus' public ministry and operation. Bethesda, a town near Capernaum. These were towns frequented by Jesus. And many of those towns rejected Jesus, even though they had the most access to him. Say it ain't so. Jesus pronounces judgment against the resident of Chorazin, but, but uh, Bethesda, I mean Bethsaida and, and Capernaum, people who had a front row seat to Jesus' ministry and yet failed to believe. Tyrant City, again, a Jewish, non, uh, gen, uh, Gentile, non-Jewish cities on the Mediterranean coast, northeast of Galilee. Jesus is saying that the Gentiles living in these cities will fare better at the final judgment than the Jews of Chorazin and, and Bethsaida, who witnessed Jesus' ministry, but rejected him. Verse 14, but it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. In the judgment refers to the final judgment when God will take account of humanity and deliver his people associated with the Old Testament with the day of the Lord. He's saying, for you, Capernaum will not be exalted to heaven, will you? It's rhetorical because the answer is no. You will be brought down to Hades. The one who listens to you, listens to me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. Now, although many are called and only a few are chosen, what are the great benefits that God guarantees all true believers? Here's a recap. Number one again, the privilege uh, of being chosen by God. Verses 10, 1 and 2. Chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. Number two, the responsibility of being used by God, which is verses th- uh, 3 through 16, and the final point again is the joy of being eternally blessed by God. These three pr- principles apply to me and you as long as we're faithful, as long as we stay the course, as long as we seek to do God's will. Watch this. Look at verse 17. The 70 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to your name. In other words, when they came back, These 72 men that he sent out two by two, they came back and they were just in awe of what they witnessed God do. They watched Satan yield to the authority God had given him. In other words, they saw Satan back up and let go. This is what they saw. Amen. But watch this. Jesus responded and said to them, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Wait a minute. They just told him about what they had seen. He reversed their attention to something more important because he says, I saw Satan fall from light, which is a reference to the judgment of Satan when he rebelled against God and was kicked out of heaven, which is Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Not only does this affirm the preexistence of Jesus and that he was involved in Satan's judgment, but it gives insight into how the devil was sentenced to earth setting the stage for the angelic conflict and the creation of mankind. It also shows that the spiritual warfare of the 72 was a continuation of the feet of Satan. Yet as, a spe- as special as this spiritual authority was, it was not to be the disciples' primary source of joy. Well, then what was or what is? 
He said, Behold, I've given you authority to trade on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Authority to trade on serpents and authority mean are physical dangers that disciples would face in their preaching and also are symbols of demonic oppression. Nevertheless, verse 20, he said, Do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subjected to you, meaning demonic spirits. He said, But rejoice that your name is recorded in heaven. That's the shout. That's what you shout. Amen. My name is recorded in heaven because I'm a believer. I'm a kingdom citizen. Now watch this. When he says, but rejoice that the names are recorded in heaven, our personal relation with Jesus as saving Lord should be our greatest joy as well as our greatest inspiration. In other words, it doesn't matter what's going on with you financially or what's going on with the crooked government. It doesn't matter what's going on with politics. What should keep you motivated and rejoicing is the fact that I'm a kingdom citizen and I'm going to be with glory to glory when I leave this earth. That should motivate you far more than anything else about you. Amen. He said, no, at the time that Jesus said this, he had not yet died. And it was not yet resurrected. Nor had he ascended back to heaven. But use a present tense verb. He's still there with them. He's still walking the earth. And he told them that your name is already in the roll book of heaven. Amen. Amen. That's good news. That's good news. So the question becomes is this. If their names are already in the land book of life, the road book of heaven, when was my name and your name put in the road book of heaven? Amen. Let me help you out. You thought it was the day you accepted Jesus as your Savior. No, your salvation was determined in eternity past. Amen. God already knew your decision before you made it. Amen. And because he knew it before you made it, he had already wrote your name in the Lamb Book of Life. And because your name is written in the Lamb Book of Life and is written by God, nobody can erase your name from the Lamb Book of Life. Because you're on the road book for heaven for eternity. That's what he's telling them to rejoice. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that because we get caught, so caught up in the physical. We get caught, so caught up in the natural. And we're so worried about this and that. And we get upset and frustrated and all these kinds of things. Yeah. People dying around us and getting sick around us. Yeah. But here's the thing about it for a believer. For a believer, death don't matter to you. Because death has no hold on you. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You're dying the Lord, you're going to be with the Lord. Amen. So we should rejoice in the fact that we're kingdom citizens. My life belongs to him. I don't have to live in fear. I don't got to be angry with the rest of the country. I don't have to be mad because who I voted for didn't win. I don't have to be mad because the Cowboys lost. I can rejoice because I got something bigger than, than my rooting for the Cowboys. It's called eternal life. Amen. Amen. And amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your powerful message, your reminder of how good you are. And the benefits of being a true disciple of yours. We just thank you, oh God. We honor you today. And we pray to God, help us to stop losing sight of Calvary. You've been so good to us, oh God. Some of us have given up because of this pandemic. We don't come to corporate worship anymore. Some of us have given up. We don't come to Bible study anymore. Some of us have given up. We don't come to prayer meeting Sunday morning anymore. Father, but I pray that you touch our hearts today. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. As David prayed in Psalm 51, when he said, Lord, is against you and only you have I seen. And, and, and you, he asked your God to restore in him a clean heart. He repented of his sins in that text. And he, he asked God and he pleaded with you never to take your Holy Spirit from him. And he promised, oh God, by restoring him, oh God, he said that he would teach transgressor your ways. In other words, he would live like he's supposed to live as a believer. 
He would say what he's supposed to say as a believer. Help us to learn from that today. Maybe there's somebody here in the sound of my voice or online, and they need to repent, and they need to turn back to you. Because their life is not all you need it to be. They're not the disciple that they should be. And maybe today they've heard you loud and clear because you told us in your word that the harvest is plenty, but the labor's a few. Lord, help us to be those laborers, those workers in your vineyard. And we realize the harvest of the vineyard is is this lost world in which we live. Maybe we go to work with the purpose of reaching someone for Christ. Maybe we go to school with reach for the purpose of reaching someone for Christ. Maybe we go talk to our neighbors for the purpose of reaching someone for Christ. Maybe we'll interact with our children for the purpose of reaching them for Christ. And no matter how many rejections we get, Lord, we'll keep up getting up and going on. And when there comes a time we need to shake the dust off and move on, help us shake the dust and move on. But not give up. And just go to the next house or the next person. And we praise you and we honor you. Thank you, oh God. And that speaks to you. And you want to recommit your life to Christ. Just pray this prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I heard you loud and clear. Lord, I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to be faithful to you. Help me to get unstuck for where I've been stuck. Help me to be more faithful in my attendance and on time. Help me to be more faithful in my Bible study attendance and in my, in my prayer time. Help me be more faithful to you. Not allow anything else or anything around me to dictate my walk with you. That my walk with you only be dictated by the Holy Spirit within me, leading me through this Christian journey called life. Father, we thank you, O God, and we bless and honor your name. Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. I admit that I'm a sinner. But right now, I give you my heart and my life. I want to walk with you, talk with you, live for you, O God. I pray now. As I've given you my heart and my life. And even if I prayed this before, Lord, I'm recommitting my life to you once again. Help me not only to know better, but to do better. Help me, oh God, and give me the strength to carry on. And help my Christian walk not be based on how I feel in in an individual moment. But help me be about doing the right thing even when my flesh doesn't feel like doing the right thing. Even when I'm tired, even when I don't feel like it, I pray to God that my love for you would override those negative feelings. And I bless and honor your name. Once again, I thank you for saving me. I ask that you restore me. I ask that you teach me. I ask that you lead me. I ask that you guide me. And more importantly, I ask that you use me. For my good and your glory, I pray. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise.
cannot be the watchman. I deny on Zion's word, my daughter, the path to heaven, offering life and peace to all. With your prayers. Let's church say amen. amen. Thank you, Reverend Sampson, for that beautiful closing hymn. If you've been blessed by today's message, we invite you to go to our website at agapecommunityfellowship.org. And we invite you to give. We act, invite you to, to give generously to the ministry at Agape. As we've been saying, that our tithes and offers have been down the last so many months, and we would ask and encourage you. Uh, to go to our website and give generously. We thank each of you who have been already been given, and we en encourage you to continue to give. We also invite you to go uh, to our website, and uh, you can also listen to uh, today's message at your own time, off your own device. You can also listen to past messages that go back, go back at least six years. Uh, and we pray that uh, you be faithful with what God has given you and be more faithful to your membership here at Agape. And we encourage you to do that. We need your presence here on Wednesday and Sunday morning for Sunday school. Uh, Sunday school teachers do an absolutely a wonderful job of teaching the Word of God. And we want to encourage you to be here for that. We want to encourage you to be here on Wednesday night for that, for our teaching lesson, because we've been praying and fasting. We've been praying on Tuesday as a church. And we invite you to join us. And so hopefully uh, that you'll come and you've been listening to some great teaching. We also want you to be more involved. Also, uh, upon the conclusion of the benediction, uh, the women of Agape, uh, there'll be a meeting for you uh, for our, our children's ministry that's starting next week. And so uh, to get some things in order, to make sure everybody was on the same page, Sister Cheryl's asking for at least 10 minutes of your, your precious time immediately after service. Amen? We thank God for each of you because you were here today because God sent you. You tuned in today because God had you tune in. And I hope that you have decided that I'm going to be all in for Jesus. Amen? Because that's when, you, that's when the power of God is unleashed in your life. When you are all in for him. Amen? Again, it's not based on how you feel because our feelings would talk us out of our blessing. Amen. Our feelings would talk us out of being used by God in great and mighty ways. So let's decide that we're going to be all in and we're going to be committed to the cause of Christ here at Agape. Again, we thank you for tuning in. And we thank you all for being here with us today. And we bless and honor God's holy name. Let us stand for our benediction.
Remember your other announcements. Remember those on our prayer list. We're praying and believing God for divine healing. We're praying God would uh, en enlarge our territories and build on this property. Uh, we also ask that uh, God would increase our membership. Through this time of praying and fasting, these are the unique things we're praying for, that everybody on our prayer list, that God will completely heal them, that God will pay off all our debt here uh, on this property, that we can do more for his kingdom and have more resources to do more ministry for his name's sake. Amen? Yes. Receive your benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May he always make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May nothing you face in life be anything you or God cannot handle. The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. And I pray that God will use you as a labor in his vineyard. And I pray that God will send more workers to harvest the vineyard. May he bless you forevermore. Whatever you're lacking, may God not only meet it, but he'd exceed it. And may God watch between me and you until we meet again as I pray. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Bless your neighbor, hug your neighbor before you leave.